Over 2,600 years ago, in a land, almost a galaxy far, far away, around 597 BC, Judah, which was the southern nation at the time that Israel had split into two factions, had turned to idolatry. God had warned them repeatedly over and over again by a series of prophets to turn away from the pagan gods. They did not. And under the Babylonian Empire led by Nebuchadnezzar, they conquered Judah, the southern kingdom. Northern Israel had previously been destroyed by Syria in the 700s BC. And over the next 10 years, Judah and Jerusalem were slowly reduced to a mere vassal state. They were slowly very systematically, very methodically destroyed. In 586, the conquering was complete and Jerusalem was leveled, it was destroyed. The nobles and the princes were deported to Babylon and other locations in the empire, but the common people, known as the Amharets, those of the land, the people of the land, the common people, many of them remained. And for nearly 20 centuries, 2,000 years, two different major Jewish theological groups existed. Jerusalem was one location and Babylon was the other. So one of the reasons when you hear the word Talmud, there are two, one from Jerusalem and one from Babylon. But the temple of Solomon, as we know it, the Solomonic temple was utterly destroyed. The ark was gone. We have no idea where it went. We have no idea. Extra biblical sources give a number of places. But as Israel was allowed to return to the desecrated temple, they began to rebuild it. They took the same site as best as they could. They reconstructed the temple. And yet, in 70 CE or AD, in that first century AD, 500 years approximately later, the Romans destroyed the temple a second time. Titus and his Roman legions marched through the city they set up their own sacrifices inside the temple. And once again, the Jewish leaders had to escape, this time to Javna, a city not too far away, and they set up what would be, for the next near 2,000 years, a temple-less, no temple, structure and religion there. The temple was central to the worship of Israel and the Jews, both collectively and individually, and you heard that Mr. Josephek's first message. All the sacrifices, all the pilgrimages that we read about in Deuteronomy 16, 16 were at the temple, not just Jerusalem. They came to go to the temple for the feast days in Jerusalem. If the synagogue structure, which we know today, had not developed probably 100 to 150 years earlier to the destruction of the temple, many people believe the central communal life of the Jews that we know today would have been lost forever. But the temple is gone. It is in Orthodox Jewry convention to pray three times a day that the temple would be rebuilt. So far, for almost 2,000 years, no temple. It has not been rebuilt as we well know. One of the feast days that was most critical in fact, it was vital to the tabernacle or temple itself. One of the feast days most vital was the Day of Atonement, the day that we celebrate today. It is a rich and deep history, varied history, important history. This was the one day the high priest could enter the temple and its holy of holies, the inner sanctum, where God would meet the high priest once a year and on one day. That is the day we celebrate. It is difficult, I would, I would say, it is difficult for us to honor and observe this day if we do not understand and appreciate and realize its singular importance, this Day of Atonement and the Temple, its, its varied history and its utter, utter uniqueness. It is known as a Sabbath of Sabbaths. It's termed that. It's the only holy day named in that fashion. But it is like trumpets, where we have no real historical tie-in to the Day of Atonement, nor do we for trumpets. I've heard all and read all the speculation. There isn't any. It's guesswork. So atonement and trumpets stand somewhat together, but atonement even more so. 
Atonement is alone because it's not on a new moon. It's not on a full moon. It's on the 10th, the 10th day of the month. I think the, the reasons for that may be interesting, but that's not the point of the message today. The point of the message today is I'd like to discuss with you some very elementary aspects that are couched in history, but those elementary aspects, I want to make sure that our younger members hear them again repeated, those younger members who are under 45 years old. The history of this day is important. It has what we call epochs or periods of service and periods where it was destroyed, and it happened again and again and again. The service is important because of by whom it was given, when it was given, why it was given, and why the temple was rebuilt. For only on this day, only on this day, Israel atoned for its sins and met God. God's presence was literally as a meeting place and a meeting time was done today. So I've got a very short title for those that like titles, One Day to Every Day. Now traditionally, Deut the, the book of Leviticus is where we start. I almost went to, <laughs> almost went to Deuteronomy. Yeah, Leviticus is where we go for the explanation of atonement. What is interesting about atonement, the Day of Atonement, there is more ink, more written specifically about this singular day than any other holy day. The Feast of Tabernacles is scattered. Uh, Passover is scattered, but it's bits and pieces. But atonement has long sections ascribed to it, both in the Hebrew Old Testament and in the New Testament. But it technically has its roots, not in Leviticus 16, as we're accustomed to, but in Leviticus chapter 10, if you'll turn there with me. And it's a very short story, a very sad story. Now remember that the high priest... Aaron was the high priest, and the high priest was by birth succession. In other words, the sons of the high priest, the sons of the high priest, became typically the high priest for many, many years. In verse 10, we learn of two of these sons. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it. It's like a, a pan or a holder uh, for, for fire or smoke. Uh, it's kind of like what we would use in our fireplaces. He has a censer. He put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane or strange fire before the eternal, which he, God, had not commanded them. So fire went out from the eternal and devoured them, and they died before the eternal. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the eternal spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. I'll read it again because God is speaking about his position, not about the people's. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. And a very sad sentence here is next. So Aaron held his peace. Aaron had just seen his two sons who were in line, utterly devoured by fire. He must have been in utter, indescribable grief. Horrible, horrible grief. Anyone who has ever lost a child could feel this. And so Aaron, it says, held his peace. Then Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp as Moses has said. Now there's a real interesting side note I'll give you if you want to do some extra study. There's an issue called corpse impurity. Now when someone has died, even today, it is an issue of corpse impurity. You're unclean if you touch a corpse. And we see this many, many times in the New Testament. But I'll refer you to Leviticus chapter 21, uh, verses 1 through 4, that there are certain exceptions to corpse impurity. Well, let's go back to the picture. Here is Aaron the high priest. He has just seen his two sons offer profane or strange fire, as it's called. They make this very odd offering of some kind. Who, who knows what it was, we are not told. But it cost them their life. And they are consumed right there in front of everyone. And Moses and Aaron are there, and Aaron holds his peace. 
It goes on and says, verse 6, And Moses said to Aaron, Eliezer, and Ithamar, his sons, Do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the people. This is how severe and serious this was of what they'd done. Don't mourn for them. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall no go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of the eternal is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. Very, very sad very, very sad section. But it's very, very clear that only at certain times can people approach God. Leviticus 11, 12, all the way to 16 gives some very interesting and diverse laws, but it's Leviticus 16 we turn now to because it talks about this day. And interestingly, it picks up the story that we've just read in Leviticus chapter 10. So in Leviticus chapter 16, we'll read verses 1 and 2. Now the Eternal spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Now how, how much time elapsed, we're not told. When they offered profane fire before the Eternal and they died, and the Eternal said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come just any time into the holy place inside the veil. So that's obviously where Aaron's sons had gone. They'd gone deep into the tabernacle, or into the tent at that point, deep inside the veil. Don't come just at any time to the Holy of Holies or the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. You can't come when you want. I will tell you when you can come. He also is then going to describe how you will come and what you will bring and what you will say and what you will do. God says you are not Aaron, though the high priest, you're not coming in whenever you want. I'm going to give some rules. God would decide the when, the how, the why, and only then would he allow this singular man and only this man access to him. We then learn about the preparations that Aaron goes through. Then verse 3, Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic, the linen trousers on his body, now remember that all this linen, because he then puts on the, the linen sash with the linen turban, he shall be attired. These are the garments for the Day of Atonement. If you see any representations in any books, I invite you to do it. It's easy on the, on the web, and many books will talk about the temple. Edersheim's book on the temple and its service is very good. Normally the high priest would be in a completely different type of clothing. In his regalia, we would call it. Here is in something very, very simple white, bleached white probably, simple tunic, linen trousers, linen sash, linen turban on his head. These are holy garments. Therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on and he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. So Aaron is as the high priest. He is allowed to go into the Holy of Holies but only once a year. He's only allowed to go in with certain clothing. He has to wash himself physically. He has to put on the clean linen clothing. It's this idea of purity and humility. And that's how Aaron is going to be going into the Holy of Holies. Note that the animals later will be sacrificed for, and there was no distinct order here in these few, few first verses. We will see that there will be sacrifices for the high priest himself, the temple, and the artifacts in it and around it, and the people. Now I'm going to read verses 6 through 22, and I'm trying to make very little comment on it because I want to give you the idea of what is happening here. I want you to think and develop a mental picture of this actually happening, because it did happen. It happened hundreds and hundreds of times. Every year the Day of Atonement came around on the calendar, this occurred. So let's just read it together. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Eternal at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Eternal, the other lot for the scapegoat, the Azazel. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Eternal's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Eternal to make atonement upon it, and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, 
and make atonement for himself for his house and shall kill the bull as the sin offering which is for himself. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the eternal. I want to stop right now. The last time that happened, two men died. With his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. Think if you were Aaron. And he shall put the incense of the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. Then he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil again. Do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself, his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the eternal and make atonement for it. And shall take some of the blood of the, of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to an uninhabited land and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. There's a lot there. I think it's better read than said, per se, with comments. There's a tremendous amount of drama. Not dramatic, not emotional, per se. Tremendous amount of work to be done. But let me ask you, note the many entrances and exits that Aaron made from the tabernacle, in and out, constantly going in, going back out, going back in, coming back out. The sheer amount of the blood, there's a lot a lot of blood. There's smoke. I'm always reminded when you go in with, if any of you have ever been to, not to denigrate, but to give by example, a, a, a high mass. How many of you have been to a mass and seen the incense and the, the smoke gets everywhere? Can you imagine an cl enclosed place with a censer? Aaron walks in, there is smoke everywhere. And God is there with him. God is there to meet him. The different aspects himself, the tabernacle, the altar, the people. Think of the, the physical acuity and the demands on Aaron as a human being, the stamina of walking in and out and doing everything according to what he has been told. Think of his mental condition. Think of that first atonement right after Leviticus chapter 10. Here is this grieving father going about the same thing his two sons did with profane fire. This was not a walk in the park. This was not something simple to do. But there was also a major issue. It's talked about in the literature. Would the high priest emerge? Leviticus 10 is important. If he went in, would he come out? What if he was not in the right attitude? I don't know, what kind of attitude would you be, brethren, if you just lost your two sons, for right or wrong? Well, they deserved it. It didn't happen like that. How would you feel? What if his attitude wasn't right? We always talk about that in the church, don't we? Bad attitude. Well, if anybody had a bad attitude, Aaron could have had a bad attitude. What if his tunic wasn't quite white, wasn't quite washed? What if the animal wasn't quite the best? There was a lot going on. We will look at it and can look at it from the physical aspect. It doesn't mean there's a harsh God. It means this is what he required. There was a lot going on. What if God didn't accept the offering? He didn't before. We're not even told what it was that Nadab and Abihu offered. What if God didn't accept the offering? This was very serious business. What if you were an Israelite? What would happen 
if the high priest lingered a little bit too long for you. If you're an Israelite and you, you didn't have a watch, but you could count the time, was the high priest in a little too long? Would he come out? What would happen? Who would they send in to get him? His next set of sons, they would be in line. Oh, they'd be great. That would be happy. That would be wonderful if you were the next in line to go into the, the temple. When we minimize what's happening here, we lose the importance of it. An entire chapter 16, and we're not going to read it all, we'll read most of it, is dedicated to this one and single day. Oh yeah, Aaron is fasting. That's why atonement messages should always be short. Because my mouth is probably going to get really leathery. And there is, thanks guys, there's no water up here. The high priest is fasting. He is grieving. If we take for granted the gravity of this event and the future atonements, the solemnity, especially after the captivity and the rebuilding of the temple, we miss the importance that God had placed on the Day of Atonement and the sacrifice at the tabernacle. We miss important facts. We'll close this section. We know that the second goat is sent into the wilderness. It pictures prophetically something uh, else both in Jewish and in our theology about Satan. Let's read verse 29. This statute, this shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month of the, ten day of the tenth day of the month, today, you shall afflict your souls. We are afflicting our souls. I am mine at least. And I'm going to feel it probably another couple of hours. And, that, and that's a good thing. You're to do no work at all. Nothing. Nada. Nothing. You're to do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the eternal. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you. This is a Sabbath. It's Sabbath Sabbaton. It is a Sabbath of Sabbaths. You shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place, this is talking about future generations, shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes, the holy garments. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. He shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar. And, for, and he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. Once a year. And he did as, lo as the eternal commanded Moses. Aaron carried it out faithfully. We don't ever read of a botched atonement. It was carried out rigorously with great solemnity. It was a very important day. It was a Sabbath, literally, of Sabbaths. By 70 AD, the temple was gone. A little over 400 years for the first temple of Solomon, barely 500 years, and the second one was gone. The Romans destroyed the second, the Babylonians destroyed the first. Both were gone. Through apostasy and revelation, revivals, the temple stood. Then it was destroyed. Then it was rebuilt. Then it was destroyed. And now it is gone. And effectively, it has been gone forever. It has been nearly 2,000 years it has been gone. The temple had been defiled and then destroyed. The high priesthood, since no temple sacrifices could ma be maintained, remained defiled. It was no more. The Levites and the other leaders of Israel were in exile, driven from the land. In fact, it got worse. Approximately in the 120s AD, to the details today are not quite clear, Emperor Hadrian, who was over Jerusalem and Israel at the time, promised to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem on the site. He did build a temple. He plowed under the temple grounds on the holy site, built the temple Jupiter Capitolinus, and set up worship to Jupiter exactly over the Temple Mount. He renamed the Jerusalem Aeolia Capitolina, a completely different name. The Jews at the time attempted a massive revolt known as the Bar Kokhba Revolt 
and under Emperor Hadrian, Julius Severus obliterated Jerusalem. They estimate that 500 to 550,000 people were killed and many, many Romans. The fighting was so severe that it's told that two Roman legions were disbanded for the number of their losses. They couldn't put the, 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 uh, uh, the group back together. The Jews, henceforth, were never allowed to enter Jerusalem again, forever, while it was under Roman rule, except on one day, known as Tisha B'Av. One day, they could come back to Jerusalem to mourn. Today, that day is still the saddest day in the Jewish calendar and commemorates all the destructions of all the temples and many other events such as the Holocaust. So Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is gone. Something pagan has been built over it. This doesn't look good. It looks horrible. But the sadder part is the people continued to sin. They defiled the land. They defiled themselves. There was no temple. There was no longer a high priesthood. But approximately 100 years before this and 40 years prior to the destruction by Rome in 70 AD, something else happened that we know. It went largely at the time very unnoticed. On Passover and possibly 30, 31 AD, Jesus called the Christ had been crucified. He claimed he was God's son as you know. He was sacrificed as a lamb for the sins of mankind as we heard in the first message. Three days later, as the wave sheaf offering, he was resurrected to life and went back to God. And then he assumed a completely and utterly different role. A completely and utterly different role, that of the high priest for all time. And that's what we'll spend the remainder of our time talking about. So we want to read of him in this new role. Well, we always want to remember the backdrop of history. Jesus knew this history, it was important. If you'll remember, he said to the disciples, and we went over this in our study of Luke in the Bible study, he said, see these buildings. There shall be not one brick, one block, one stone left upon another. But it took nearly 40 years to have that happen. He knew, he was aware of the history. He helped conduct it. He's the one that sent the prophets to Israel and to Judah to warn them to turn away from idolatry. And so this is an important role that he has. And there's only one book in the New Testament that talks about it and does so expansively, chapter after chapter. Only one book. And that's the book of Hebrews. And we heard in the scripture reading at the beginning. We will not read all of Hebrews. What we want to give you is the essence of both the old and the new. What was, and what had to happen, and what is forever and ever and ever, and how it has changed. We still continue, even today, some 3,500 years later, we keep this day that Moses and Aaron and the people of Israel, they kept this day. We keep this day, and Jesus Christ kept this day. So if you would turn with me to the book of Hebrews, we'll start in Hebrews chapter nine. And I would encourage you, if you have the time pondering your stomach and your head talking to you, the rest of atonement, is to read Hebrews 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. It's, it's a very quick read. And, sh- and you can read it in one sitting. And it's a beautiful, beautiful example of what we're going to talk about just specifically in focus here. Now, the writer of Hebrews, and again, we can speculate who it might be. It's really unimportant. It's in the canon. It's important, and it speaks to the truth of God. In chapter 10, it recounts for the audience of the book that is being written to, the Hebrews, it recounts things they know. It says, chapter 10, excuse me, chapter 9, verse 1, then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. It's all about the temple. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. He's describing it all to them. Then he says 
of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now, when this was written, the temple, we believe, still stood. But inside the Holy of Holies, it was empty. The ark was gone. They had to reconstruct anything else that they had for the temple. He then says of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Because in the Babylonian captivity, the ark and many of the artifacts of the temple in the area, because they were overlaid with gold, they were taken. And so he recounts what we just read in Leviticus, verse 6. He says, now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. And this was part of what they did on, they had the evening and morning sacrifices. They had a lot of work to do every day in the temple. And they would go about the temple, we call it the temple precincts, the area around the temple every day. But into the second part of the high priest went alone once a year, one man, one time, once a year. Not without blood, we read that, which he offered for himself, for the people's sins committed in ignorance, which is interesting. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic, in many ways it was. But let me ask you a question. He states here, he says, the writer does, it says, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made known or manifest. What do you mean they didn't know the way in? They knew the way in. It went through the first part into the second part behind the veil. I mean, it's not like it needed a sign. They knew the way. Aaron never got lost. Aaron always knew where to go, straight ahead. He knew how to get to the holiest of all. Why would the writer say the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest? Because he possibly is talking about another way, a better way. A better way where? Into the holiest of all. The language is interesting because he doesn't make the transition, but he, he asks he makes us ask the question, did they not know the way? Yes, they knew the way. So indeed, he must be talking about another way. In fact, we know of a way. We call it the way. And someone else that we'll reference in the book of John said he was the way, and we'll recall this later. Verse 9, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. I want you to remember that word because the writer uses the word conscience over and over again. What is your conscience? Your mind. It is the repository of your memories. Your entire life is in your mind, in your conscience. It's not in your stomach. It's not in your feet. Your conscience is that inanimate thing that scientists even today cannot determine what it is. It's this spiritual, this non-physical entity. It is your conscience. Let's read it again. Offering gifts and sacrifices which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. It concerned only with food and drink, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Until the time of reformation. And so consciences weren't made perfect. They weren't, we would say, they weren't cleansed. They, left, they were left untouched till the next year in which they would have the Day of Atonement again. So that is a very clear distinction. He talks about the temporary. They were temporary things. It was a temporary tabernacle. It didn't last. It kept being destroyed. In fact, at the time of the writing of Hebrews, it was not many years after that, it would be destroyed again, and this time permanently. So let's continue reading. In verse, verse 11, I want you to notice the three knots here. There's three knots, N-O-T-S. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect, there's that word perfect again, perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, or we would say once and for all having obtained eternal redemption. Can you see the contrast here between temporary things and they were ordained by God, no, no doubt about it, incredibly important. God ordained them. God told them and gave them instructions on how to do it. These are not trivial things. 
They were God-ordained, but they were temporary. But even more so, in verse 13, he enters with the word if. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify for the purifying of the flesh, how much more? See the contrast? If this were the case, if the blood of bulls and goats uh, sanctified for the purifying of the flesh, which it did, else they wouldn't have done it. It says that they were made atonement for, a completed act. If the blood of animals sanctified the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who is the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God and cleanse your mind? Conscience, mind, you, it's who you are. You're not just a, a bag of bones, a hank of hair, and some blood. You are a conscience, a mind. You have a will. And this is what the writer of Hebrews says is cleansed. What is it cleansed from? Interestingly, it's cleansed from physical things, dead works, to serve the living God. And that is the objective. And for this reason, he, Jesus Christ, is the mediator of the new covenant, my means of death, for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Notice the contrast between physical things and eternal things. It doesn't mean bad and good. It means good and better, wonderful and more wonderful, almost perfect and utterly perfect, by contrast. He says, for where, verse 16, he says, for where there is a testament, there must also be of necessity the death of the testator. For a testament is enforced after men are dead. If, you, if, you, if it's easier, don't use the word testament, use the word will. Wills don't go enforced to predominantly until someone dies. If a testament is enforced after men are dead, it has no power at all while the testator lives. It's to be executed upon their death. Therefore, not even the first will was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with scar water, scarlet wool, hyssop, sprinkled the book itself and all the people. This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled the blood with the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. These are very important words. And now we move to chapter 10. One of the most important things that we understand is this great history. And the writer of Hebrews wants his readers, as I want you, and I think it's important for us, to understand the history, the long, arduous, sometimes very troubling, but sometimes very wonderful history of what had happened. Why would the writer of Hebrews in the first century AD talk about something that hadn't existed for six or 700 years? Because it was important, it was meaningful, and he wanted them to remember. Chapter 10, verse, first, I'm gonna to skip to verse 11. I'll, I'd love to read the whole thing, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll skip around a little bit. In verse 11 he said, Every, every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly. This is chapter 10, verse 11. Every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Not ultimately. Now notice this phrase, every priest stands ministering. It's in the present progressive tense, meaning while the writer of Hebrews is writing this, the temple stood. So while he's writing, there is a priest going into the temple on the Day of Atonement and every other day, going into the temple and on the Day of Atonement of the Holy of Holies while he's writing. He's saying it can never take away sins. Not like he's talking about it. It does take away sins physically, fleshly. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, who is this? He doesn't even call him Jesus Christ. He says, this man that everyone would know after he, Jesus, had offered one sacrifice, notice, priest, many sacrifices, didn't, didn't atone for sins ultimately. This one man, with his own blood, his own sacrifice, 
for sins forever sat down at the right hand of God. Aaron did not sit down anywhere when he got done atoning. If you read Leviticus 16 again, he had to wash himself and do other things. But Jesus Christ, when he was done, he ascended to God on the wave sheaf offering after Passover and the resurrection during the days of unleavened bread. He sits down at the right hand of God. You can't get better than that. When we're in front of the king, when we're in front of the God, when we're in the court, have you ever, anyone, seen somebody sit and Queen Elizabeth comes into the room? They do not. They are prompted, if they don't, to get up. You will stand when the king or the queen arrives. To sit, to sit in the presence of the king, let alone God, is a point of honor. And from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. And that is a very, very interesting phrase. The footstool concept has to do with the temple and the tabernacle uh, and the mercy seat, which is God's footstool. For by one offering, one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being, being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant. This is from Jeremiah 31. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Eternal. I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds, and I will write them. And then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is no remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. And that's important. The covenant in many ways continues. It continues, but it is written upon better promises. It's written upon our hearts, and interestingly, there's that word again, their minds, as they're being sanctified. It's like indelible, permanent ink. When you, in the Old Testament, New Testament, when you said your heart, you meant that was you. But we know a mind is important. So he's saying heart and mind, that is where these laws will be written, on our hearts and in our minds. That's where God's law will be. But there is more, much, much more. Because he begins in verse 19, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us though through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and all assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our, faith, our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. There's a lot there. Whenever we pray, I think most of the ministry, especially when we do an anointing, and many people when they pray, as we approach God's throne, we're hopefully in a very humble, on our knees, or our heads bowed, in a very humble position. We do so with the access to God's throne that no one is allowed to access except by blood of Jesus Christ. And you'll hear that mentioned often in prayers, that we beseech you, God, and we come to your very throne, as you said we can, and you said we should. But we do so and have access because it is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what it says here. There is no access. There is no lock in the key. No opening of the door without this type of access. And this is because Jesus is qualified as the high priest of God, the one and only high priest, and he has sat down at the right hand of God. Access. That was the objective for thousands and thousands of years. That's what Nadab and Abihu wanted, access. God said, once a year. Once a year and I will come down. You can meet me once a year. Yes, they could pray. This is different. This is intimate access of going directly to God, not through anyone, except through the, the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Abraham to Moses all desired access to God. And Jesus, in fact, in John 14, verse 6, that is where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says that word again, we are, we, are, we are protected or perfected or cleansed from an evil conscience. God says he forgets about it. It's us who keeps bringing it up. Once God has heard it he for, and you're humbly repentant, he forgets it. That's what he says. 
He cleans the conscience. He's trying to. He's trying to. It's us, I think, who bring it up. Because only you know the sins you have committed. I don't know them, and I don't need to know them. There are sins you have committed and that I've committed. No one knows. Now, I'm not up on a federal rap, so right now, just don't think that I've done anything uh, a felony. But all of us have committed sins that only we know. And God. God knows. And so he is willing to forgive and write laws on our hearts and our minds. So let's conclude and apply. He says in verse 24, it's very interesting. After all that he's talked about on the Day of Atonement, all about the, pre, the high priest of old and Jesus Christ as the new high priest, he ends this, very, this section very interestingly. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. This word love keeps coming up. It was brought up in the first message. It, came, it comes up here. I didn't write this. To stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as it is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. The writer three times references or implies one another in three different ways. Toward, he says, word, works of love. The word is agape there. Works of love. To not forsake one another. To assemble together like we are doing here. And that's important. We collectively here observe the Day of Atonement. But he also says we are to exhort or better encourage one another as the day approaches. The day approaches. The day of trumpets approaches. It's closer by a day today than it was yesterday. It's closer by a week than it was a week ago. It's closer by a year than it was a year ago. And he says we are, are to encourage. Hopefully this day encourages you. It reminds you of what we have been given. So how do we do this? We encourage acts of loving kindness one to another. We meet together as we do here and again Sabbath and again during the feast if we can. We encourage one another and we give each other hope. We don't tear one another down. We build each other up. There are many other co concepts of this very complex day, and it is a complex day. Fasting in its depth, the putting away or removal of Satan prophetically, as well as the millennial concepts. But today, I wanted to concentrate here and now, here and now, and where we live here and now. So when I concentrate, and I'm ending because if I don't, I'll become long-winded. If I become long-winded, your stomach will start talking to you, either your stomach or your head. But when we look at atonement, doesn't atonement, a day unlike any other day, honored for over 3,500 years with rich and varied ceremony, culminating in Jesus Christ as the high priest, I think it speaks to three concepts. God through Christ in an act of loving kindness Technically, <coughs> excuse me, as we accept Christ's sacrifice, uh, he cleans us up, doesn't he? He makes us who we are not, but we are forgiven. Because of this cleaned up, or this cleanness that he gives us, <coughs> we repent. Fasting, I don't know about you, makes us very humble, makes us very, very fragile, only one day, and makes us very, very grateful. As one person said long ago to me, they said, the Day of Atonement should remind the church what it's like in a third of the world to go home or to go to bed hungry. So we are very grateful. But thirdly, and almost most importantly, it allows us to meet God together whenever and wherever we need him. In humility, God will always answer us because we have this access. He indeed gives us hope that one day we indeed all of us, everywhere, will be together. Have a wonderful Day of Atonement.